Hello and welcome to another live broadcast with MedStar Health. My name is Michelle Bowman and today I'm joined by Dr. Geetha Jayabalan, board certified vascular surgeon with MedStar Heart and Vascular Institute. She also leads uh, MedStar Health Vein Centers in Annapolis. Our discussion today is gonna to focus on varicose veins. Uh, with summer right around the corner, some of you may be unhappy about the way your legs look and we wanna let you know how we can help. So if you'd like to learn more about varicose and spider veins, treatment options to relieve the pain safely and effective ways to restore a healthier appearance, stick around. Also share this broadcast with your friends and uh, give us a like to let us know that you're watching and share your, your questions and comments below. We're gonna take some time to answer those as well. So Dr. Jaya Balan, welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, before we begin our discussion, will you tell our viewers a little bit about yourself and the work you do here at MedStar Health? Wonderful, thank you, Ms. Shan. Thanks for inviting me today um, to be a part of this uh, great uh, educational opportunity, uh, really for, for all of us. And I'm glad we get to reach a broad audience um, through this platform. So again, it's, it's great to kind of link up with everyone and allow people to have a, a great discussion. Um, so I just wanted to introduce myself. Um, as Ms. Shan mentioned, my name is Geetha Jayabalan. I am a board certified vascular surgeon. Um, I've been in the area for uh, close to five years now um, and was in Pittsburgh earlier. And as a vascular surgeon, uh, we treat a broad variety of conditions that affect the circulation throughout the body. Um, not a lot of people in the public know exactly what a vascular surgeon does. And so just to give you kind of a, an overview, um, like I said, we treat blood vessels from the neck all the way down to the toes. So we deal with patients who've had strokes and need carotid um, disease worked up, dialysis patients, folks that have aneurysms, and then really we focus a lot of our time and effort on people that have circulation issues in the legs. And legs are complicated because we have both sides of the circulation to deal with. So there are arterial disease pathologies that we manage and also what we're talking about today, which affects a lot of people um, throughout the United States and that is uh, varicose veins and venous insufficiency. Okay. Well, thank you for that introduction. Uh, sounds like a lot of uh, territory within the body that uh, you, you guys, you vascular surgeons are in charge of managing and helping patients um, uh, manage as well. So thank you and thank you, thank you for your time as well. Um, so first off, uh, could you explain what uh, varicose and spider veins are and if there's a difference between the two? That's a great question. So um, I'm going to start off kind of to, to backtrack from that question just to kind of give people basic definitions um, because sometimes people don't really even know what the difference between uh, what a vein and an artery is. So the arteries are basically the tubes in the bodies that bring blood from the heart down through the chest, the stomach, and then they branch like tree branches into smaller blood vessels that deliver blood down to the legs and feet. The veins are a little more complicated. So there are the return pipes in the body. And the way these veins are built in the legs is we actually have two networks of veins in each leg. So we have a deep network and a superficial network of veins. And each of those networks has a series of one-way valves, which is truly remarkable that we were built this way because these valves basically have to pump blood against gravity down from the feet all the way up through the legs to the big veins in the, in the belly, and then eventually all the way back up to the right side of the heart. So the veins really are a critical piece of our circulation. Sometimes the valves that I mentioned to you in the veins can get damaged or leaky and cause trouble. So we're, we're going to kind of get into that a little bit deeper um, later in our, um, in our session. But in terms of what 
varicose veins are and spider veins are, are they are kind of the abnormal veins that exist in the superficial network of veins in the legs. And so varicose veins tend to be the larger, bulging, ropey, kind of almost twisted. They look like little worms underneath the, the skin. Yeah. And oftentimes people can just look down and, and see them and they can sometimes even be tender to touch or palpation. The spider veins are exactly what they sound like. So spider veins are typically a millimeter or less. So we're talking um, the veins that essentially look like little kind of, um, you know, cobwebs and you sometimes get them, they can happen on the legs, they can actually happen elsewhere um, too. They can happen in the chest wall and, and sometimes, uh, you know, in the trunk. And there is a little, little, very, very tiny, fine superficial veins that almost look like little starbursts under the skin. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, spider veins tend not to really cause symptoms. Um, as I was mentioning earlier with the varicose veins, the spider veins tend to be um, usually more, uh, tend to be more cosmetic, um, cosmetically bothersome for, for people, but they can also cause symptoms. Thank you for, for breaking that down. Very thorough explanation and very uh, educational, I got to say. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you mentioned, you touched on this a little bit, uh, but how can a patient tell if they have uh, varicose or spider veins? What uh, signs should they be looking out for? That's a good question. So with age, um, and it's not always age, sometimes it's even at younger ages, but we, we do tend to form abnormal veins in the legs. And it's just a function of um, getting older, you know, being on our feet a lot. You know, again, these, these veins are, are meant to work our entire lives against the forces of gravity. So it's a lot to ask of them. Um, but the, the varicose veins or the abnormal veins in the legs are the ones that when you look down, they tend to kind of form these abnormal patterns under the skin, and they're very superficial, meaning you can actually push on them and they tend to um, kind of compress and then release. And, and those are the veins that really should not be there at the very superficial layers of, of the skin. And same thing with the spider veins. You can actually see them at the very surface of the skin and they almost look like tiny little bruises, um, like I said, with that starburst pattern. Um, and that's, that's typically how you can tell that it's a varicose vein versus um, a vein that we're kind of just meant to, to you know, have. And those veins tend to be straighter and they tend to be very clearly connected. Um, and you can usually see that, for instance, in our arms, you can see patterns of superficial veins that are just, they all look like straight pipes. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, and what causes varicose veins? Where do they come from? That's a great question. Um, and the, the honest answer is that we don't know exactly um, how to pinpoint the cause in most people, because in most people, it's a variety of factors that cumulatively predispose them to having varicose veins. And so the risk factors for varicose veins actually include genetics. And so we do know that there is some hereditary component of varicose veins that, that does predispose certain people to having them. So we always do take a family history and ask about whether or not varicose veins tend to run in the family or if someone's had any clotting disorders in the family, et cetera. So that's, that's one component. Other things that can cause varicose veins are, or are risk factors for varicose veins are being female. And with being female, um, pregnancy and hormonal changes can really uh, tend to be kind of the triggering point in, in our lives when these tend to flare up. And sometimes for women, um, the varicose veins will get very symptomatic with pregnancy and then get a little bit better and, and kind of come back at various points with these hormonal fluctuations throughout our lives. Um, other things include weight. Um, sometimes being overweight can also contribute 
age, so age greater than 50 is a risk factor for varicose veins. However, young people get varicose veins all the time. So that alone is, is not in and of itself, you know, an exclusion. Um, other things that can also contribute to varicose veins are, you know, things such as prolonged, you know, standing or types of work where, you know, people have many, many years of really just, um, you know, not having any kind of uh, ability to necessarily move frequently or um, exercise frequently. And the reason that's important, especially now in the era of, of COVID and with a lot of folks teleworking um, at home, sitting at a desk for hours. The reason I bring that up is because, um, you know, not, not moving your calf muscle very often um, can lead to kind of stagnation in the veins. And over time, that can also kind of make varicose veins worse. Okay. I think that's a good segue to our next question. Um, are there certain people who are more prone to getting varicose veins? Certainly um, there are, and those risk factors um, do include kind of the categories that I mentioned. And so women by far tend to be um, at greatest risk. Um, I, I say that, however, um, there are a lot of men who have varicose veins as well, and even younger men. And so it's not something that, um, you know, people often ask, you know, can, can men, you know, get uh, varicose veins? And the answer is absolutely yes. And in fact, unfortunately, I think a lot of men tend to um, get delays in care or delays in seeking treatment um, because they don't often recognize that it's a problem and that truly what they have is, is varicose veins causing some symptoms. Um, and so that, that's despite it being overwhelmingly, you know, women, men, men can get that too. Um, certain other folks are also more prone, like people with um, certain types of heart failure um, can, can get varicose veins more easily. Um, folks that have had prior blood clots in their legs also can have damage to those valves that I was talking about. And over time, that in turn can lead to varicose veins as well. Um, and that's, that pretty much covers it. It's a pretty broad um, population of folks. And, and like I said, hereditary. So some people, they're really, their only risk factor is just that they've had, you know, moms had it, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, ants have had it and, and that's, and now they have it too. Okay. Yeah, I was just about to ask you about uh, men, if they can get it, uh, because often, um, at least, you know, in commercials or wherever you see it advertised, it's more seen as a cosmetic issue that, you know, women are more concerned about than men. So thank you for, for um, sharing that, you know, anyone can, this is something that anyone could possibly get. So thank you. Absolutely. Um, and uh, if, uh, if someone's legs are constantly uh, tired and achy, could that be a sign of varicose veins or, you know, say for instance, they, they have swollen or puffy ankles, is that also an indicator? Absolutely. Um, one of the possibilities is varicose veins or venous insufficiency. Um, swollen, tired, heavy legs, um, kind of all are broad symptoms. And typically it's, you know, not necessarily that varicose veins automatically is the culprit for all of those symptoms, but it needs to be considered if someone is consistently having those symptoms and additionally might have some prominent veins that they're seeing on their legs. Um, that's definitely something to consider. Typically, when folks have those kinds of symptoms and are concerned that vein issues might be playing a role, um, we, we kind of evaluate the whole patient. So we're not looking at them with blinders on and, and just looking at their legs. And the reason I mention that is because sometimes other um, issues or other health problems can also cause some of those symptoms. Um, you know, such as, uh, like I mentioned, heart issues, um, kidney problems, sometimes um, lymphedema, which is a different type of, of swelling that can often uh, occur alongside vein problems. Um, 
all of those all of those symptoms can can be related to those other health issues too. So when we evaluate a patient who comes in with exactly that constellation of symptoms, we we kind of go very methodically through a their history, medical history, um, their current symptoms, and then make sure that we're not forgetting about these other issues that could be contributing before we focus on just you know, looking at the veins as a potential cause of those symptoms. Great, thank you. Um, at this time, I wanna pause and welcome our viewers again. If you're just joining us, thank you for tuning in. Uh, today, we're discussing uh, varicose veins, what causes them, uh, treatment options, and effective ways to restore a healthier appearance. I'm here with Dr. Geetha Jayabalan, board certified vascular surgeon at MedStar Heart and Vascular Institute in Annapolis. Uh, we have more to talk about, so keep watching. Share this broadcast with your friends. Uh, give us a like to let us know that you're watching and ask your questions in the comments below. We're gonna take some time to answer those in a bit. Uh, so back to some of, uh, some of my questions. Um, are varicose veins uh, primarily a cosmetic issue? I think the answer would be no at this point. Um, or can they be a sign of something uh, more serious, some underlying issue? Um, another great question, and it, it really um, makes me think of a, a lot of our patients who, for a long time, you know, tend to ignore some of their leg symptoms, thinking that indeed, oh, this this is just ugly legs, and uh, it's no big deal, and I'll just deal with it later and, and not worry about it until their their symptoms get pretty bad. And so, this is a nice opportunity to to educate people about the fact that sometimes when people do have these persistent symptoms, such as swelling, heaviness, um, ankle uh, puffiness, as you mentioned, fatiguing of the legs, um, sometimes just having kind of um, prominent varicose veins that are noticeable on the legs, they can be a sign of underlying valve kind of insufficiency. So as we talked about at the beginning of the hour, the way our legs are built in terms of the return pipes is we have these very kind of complex networks of veins that have these valves that are supposed to be one-way valves. They're not supposed to let blood travel south. They're supposed to keep blood pumping back up north. Sometimes if those valves are leaky or if they're damaged from whatever it might be, prior blood clot, prior phlebitis, inflammation, sometimes those valves are not closing quickly enough. And if they're not closing quickly enough or they're not closing all the way, that blood can start to stagnate or, or remain in the superficial network of veins in the lower part of the leg. And over time, that can lead to damage um, and it can lead to uh, chronic discoloration of uh, the skin of the leg, sometimes even creating what we call claudication or difficulty walking in the leg. Um, and then in, in some cases, it can lead to ulcers or wounds appearing um, in the legs if it's left untreated for, for long periods of time. All right. So Thank absolutely, you. In, you know, in a, the short answer is yes, there's more than meets the eye and so sometimes what we're seeing at the surface doesn't really tell us the whole story. Okay. So in, in best case scenario, if, if you're ever in doubt, you know, reach out to a vein specialist. So, Correct. Yeah. Don't you. underestimate your symptoms is, is I think the take home message because, um, yeah. and again, speaking to the, to the women in the audience, but also <laughs> the men, um, you know, women tend to, uh, downplay uh, symptoms or mm -hmm. just be very busy uh, taking care of everyone else in the family and, and sometimes exactly. not paying attention to their own symptoms until they get really bad. And so that's why I, I emphasize kind of getting uh, earlier care is a good way to initiate certain measures that can help prevent progression of some of this. Yes, it's always best to be proactive. So yeah, thank you for that advice. Mm -hmm. um, so when someone finally makes that appointment and they get an evaluation, uh, what typically happens uh, during an evaluation for varicose veins? Wonderful. 
So when, um, when we have a patient come in specifically for varicose vein evaluation, we go through a thorough history, as I mentioned, asking um, and paying close attention to medical issues that are chronic, um, and also even simple things like medications. Certain things can you know, impact uh, leg symptoms, so that's important as well family history, and so an interview much like this. You know, we sit down in the office and chat about the history and also the symptoms and find out exactly what kind of symptoms that particular patient is experiencing because every everyone's different. Some people have swelling as a primary component. Other people have no swelling, but they might just have pain. Um, and, you know, it just varies from individual to individual. So we do that. We also do a physical examination. Again, um, because we're vascular surgeons and we are comprehensive uh, when it comes to circulation and circulation disorders, when we do our physical examination, we pay attention to not only uh, the veins and the legs, but we're also paying attention to the arterial circulation as well. Um, sometimes patients have both sides of the circulation that can be affected and that can impact their symptoms. And so as part of our physical exam, we do all of that to, to really see where the problem areas are and what other things could be impacting current symptoms. So that's kind of the initial um, evaluation. And then if, if based on that, we are concerned that someone has varicose veins that might be related to any of those valve problems that we discussed, then as part of the evaluation, because you're probably wondering, well, how, how do they know my valves are an issue, um, is, is part of the evaluation is an ultrasound. And an ultrasound is a non-invasive, relatively quick study, um, doesn't require any radiation, it just uh, involves taking a probe and kind of looking at the veins and the legs. And we have excellent, um, very, very experienced uh, vascular ultrasound technologists who are specially trained for this type of ultrasound um, because it does involve um, positioning and things and it involves expertise to do it properly. And what we do with that ultrasound is we actually look to see, number one, is there any evidence of any clot in the superficial or deep system of veins in the legs? And then number two, we look to see how quickly and effectively are the valves in the veins actually opening and closing. And so all of that information is really kind of the complete package as to the initial evaluation for symptoms. Thank you. Um, some and some people in our audience may be uh, aware of compression stockings or possibly the, I guess, the copper uh, uh, stockings. I've seen those in a few commercials before. Uh, but could you explain what compression stockings are, how they work, and if they're beneficial and should everyone be wearing them? Again, Excellent questions, and you guys probably, you know, see on uh, on TV nowadays. You watch any kind of pro basketball game or football or whatever, and all these athletes have compression on because they know <laughs> that <laughs> that you know this um, is that a it usually the legs feel better with compression, especially after a workout. So even in the absence of um, of varicose veins, having you know compression. Uh, on the legs during active, you know, exercise is, is helpful. Okay. Um, and then the best analogy I can give about compression is not all compression is created equal. Okay. So a lot of folks ask me, well, what, what, what does this compression actually do? So wearing just tight socks is really not what graduated compression stockings are. So the type of compression that we specifically are talking about when it comes to varicose veins or folks that have kind of leg heaviness or swelling are graduated compression stockings. So these are stockings that come in various grades and strengths and they come all the way from really kind of light compression five to ten 
and they go all the way up in grade to 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury. That's how they're measured. And what I want you guys to think about is compression is the way these stockings are built are to mimic you standing in a column of water like a swimming pool. So if you're standing in a swimming pool, the way the pressure is against the leg is most of the pressure is at the ankle and foot and it gradually decreases as you come up the leg. And so the way the compression stocking is actually built and woven is that most of the actual tightness and compression is down below and it gradually decreases as you come up the leg, which is why when people are shopping for compression, they'll see ranges written on the actual strength, like 20 to 30, 15 to 20. And that refers to the fact that the stocking that they're getting has that higher strength at the bottom part of the stocking, and then it gradually decreases to the lower length as you come up. And the reason that those stockings are so effective is that as you're walking, it actually helps and assists the veins to kind of empty and move up north like they're supposed to. And it helps prevent some of that stagnation of blood that we were talking about earlier. Okay. Now, are the, I'm just curious, are, are these stockings on, only accessible through a vascular surgeon or expert, or is this something that people can, you know, find a, you know, their favorite online retailer or yeah. is it hard to find? It's not hard to find actually. That's the good news, especially in the era of online, um, you know, retail, you can, you know, even Google graduated compression stocking. And I think that's kind of the, the key word um, because again, that's different than just having, like I said, a, a tight sock, which sometimes just has equal compression all the way through, which, which can be helpful, but it's not going to perform the same um, kind of function as, as graduated um, compression stockings do. So a simple search like that it will help. Now, sometimes sorting out the strength of the compression can be a little tricky. And that's why, um, you know, if there is concern that this is being worn for the purpose of vein insufficiency, it's helpful to kind of get the evaluation and then get a recommendation as to what actually might be effective for you as an individual patient. Okay, so graduated compression stockings, keyword to know. <laughs> yes, that's right. right. Thank you. Um, uh, could you explain um, uh, any treatment options for uh, varicose veins? So, um, you know, people often get frustrated when they hear the word stockings because it sounds like, oh gosh, I gotta wear these, you know, these stockings and it's summer and oh my God, you know, and it, totally understand. No one wants to be wearing stockings 24 seven. And, um, you know, stockings though are a key cornerstone of, of long-term management of vein insufficiency. But, um, you know, I heard this uh, recently uh, and it's a great analogy that, you know, stockings are like glasses. They really only work when you have them on, you know, they're not, they're not magical fixes, meaning it, yes, they're helpful when you have them on and it's just not a long-term fix for the problem. So, um, so graduated compressions is one of the piece of, of treat, pieces of, uh, of therapy um, to help with the symptoms related to varicose vein. Elevation of the legs, so intermittently getting the legs kind of above the level of the heart can be helpful, but most of us in the middle of a busy work day can't uh, uh, afford to, you know, do a little yoga uh, headstand to get, get our legs up. So that, that's kind of a little impractical. Um, exercise is a huge, huge help for anyone with vein insufficiency because, like I was mentioning earlier, anytime we pump the calf muscle, it helps drain the blood. And so I, I tell a lot of my patients who are um, struggling with this that as part of all the other options that we have to treat this, when you're at home or at work and a lot of us are chained to our computers, take, put your timer on your, on your uh, phone or your watch and every hour get up and do just a lap around the office, the workplace, wherever you might be, because it, it sounds minor, but even getting up for a few minutes and getting that calf muscle activated can actually help return circulation. Okay. 
so those those things that I mentioned are all kind of they're available to all of us, right? It, you can get compression, you can elevate your legs, you can um, exercise and and move your calf muscles or walk, um, but sometimes that's not enough. And sometimes people try those things and they do a great job with it, and lo and behold, you know, still having symptoms because those valves may not be working well, or just because the, the varicose veins are giving them trouble. And so luckily, um, you know, people often think of the old days where vein stripping used to be kind of the, the way varicose veins were managed. So if you talk to your grandparents or mm -hmm. even, you know, older folks will tell you, wow, you know, I had 10 incisions up and down the leg and, and I had to have, you know, major vein surgery. But luckily um, we have, you know, gotten much kind of savvier with time and technology has really allowed us to offer minimally invasive solutions for a variety of vein problems. And so when we do a workup with the patient and their symptoms in their legs seem to be related to varicose veins, and we, let's say, do the ultrasound and we find out, hey, we, we have some issues with, with some of these veins not working properly. We can sometimes offer what we call ablation therapy, where it's um, an office-based procedure, doesn't take much time at all, and there's no downtime. And it's a way to essentially close a non-functioning vein so that it doesn't continue to cause trouble for the rest of the veins and the legs, or it doesn't continue to cause some of those downstream symptoms that we were discussing earlier, such as discoloration, heaviness, um, leg, uh, leg pain, and swelling. And so those procedures are done very quickly and safely um, under ultrasound guidance is normally how we perform them. And um, because they're so minimally invasive, we're able to do it with just some local anesthesia. And um, folks, you know, get up and walk out of the office and there's luckily no downtime. So we've come a long ways in terms of our, our treatment options from, you know, big vein surgeries. Um, the flip side of that is, you know, sometimes in, in certain types of cases, um, minimally invasive options are, are not, are, are available, but not the only thing that the patient needs. And so having a vascular surgeon be the person or the physician evaluating the patient is really important because not only do we offer the minimally invasive options, but if someone does need more of a surgical intervention, we obviously have that option as well. That's good to hear that things, you know, for the for the most part, thing treatment options are minimally invasive. It's not something that people have to schedule, for, you know, a week off of their life to to tend to this issue. So that's that's really good news. Good news to hear. Um, so uh, in terms of treatment, is are these treatment options permanent? Are any of them permanent, or is this something that a patient would have to maintain over time? So. Veins are, um, are very smart, and uh, the reason I say that is because the way we're built is such that um, even when we take a vein out, and people might know that, for instance, when we do bypass surgeries, um, folks that have heart bypass, uh, a lot of times the veins in the legs can be used and harvested and, and removed, and even in those situations, the body is smart enough to recognize, hmm, um, that vein was removed. Well, I might have to, you know, potentially regrow another pathway to make up for that. And, and it's, while on one hand, that's great because it means the body can compensate for having that vein gone. On the other hand, on occasion, when that new vein appears, most of the time it's fine and it can be functional and competent. Sometimes, it can be another vein that has similar issues as the first one. And so unfortunately, there's no such thing as a true um, cure for varicose veins, but there are a lot of great treatment options that provide long lasting um, you know, relief and impact on patients, um, but know that they can recur. 
And so the trick is, you know, just being vigilant about symptoms and and seeing that if there is recurrence to, to get checked up again, um, to see if there could be something else going on there. All right, thank you. Um, another question I have um, is, Bruising, is, is bruising normal uh, to see after treatment? And if so, uh, how long does that typically last? Right, so bruising after treatment uh, varies depending on the type of treatment that is done, okay. is, is the answer to that. So if um, someone has a, a ablation, which is what we had talked about before, where we essentially use a small catheter in the vein to try to close it, most of the time, there's actually minimal bruising after that because all we're doing is little kind of uh, small little uh, puncture wounds, and that doesn't really cause much in the way of bruising. When we do certain other types of vein procedures, um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, sometimes people require phlebectomy or removal of some of the larger veins in the legs, and that actually involves making little incisions and pulling those, those veins out it's very common to have bruising after that, which usually resolves within three to four weeks after the procedure. When we do cosmetic um, or sclerotherapy, and uh, going back to the beginning of the um, discussion, we talked about some of those superficial veins, um, the spider type veins in the legs that are, you know, millimeter or, you know, those slightly larger ones that are called reticular veins, one to three millimeters in size, so teeny tiny. When we go in and inject these veins um, in order to kind of irritate them and get them to kind of disappear, the initial phase of that is a lot of times you just, people have discoloration and a bruise that is visible. That takes several weeks to get better. Most of the time that's gone within that three to four week range. It, depending on the individual skin, uh, you know, condition, it can take a little bit longer than that as well. All right. Thank you. Um, I know we talked uh, at the beginning of our uh, uh, broadcast, we talked about the difference between uh, varicose and spider veins. So in terms of treatment, are the treatment options any different? What, what does treatment look like for spider veins? Yeah, so um, varicose veins and spider veins often occur kind of simultaneously in a lot of folks. And so um, the decision to treat one versus the other often depends on the patient's preference. So if um, we have gone in, let's say, and done a vein closure um, for all those other symptoms we talked about, heaviness, swelling, and, and so forth, and then um, someone has symptoms that or, or concerns about appearances of some of their spider veins, that is um, an option or the option that I mentioned earlier of sclerotherapy is another way to treat those veins. So sclerotherapy, what that word means is basically um, it's a, again, an office-based procedure that's uh, done by actually inserting a very, very small needle into those tiny veins and injecting a material, in this case, it's called polydocanol, or, or um, there's various kind of uh, commercial names for it, um, but it, it's essentially an irritant to the veins. And so what happens is when we inject that irritant into those superficial spider veins, what happens is it actually creates an inflammatory reaction within the vein, and it causes the vein to actually form debris and clot on the inside of the vein by irritating the lining of the vein. So what happens is once that vein stops having actual blood flow through it, it fades away slowly with time. So that's what sclerotherapy is. And that's kind of a common, again, a Google search word when, when people look at uh, varicose vein treatments, that word often pops up. And, and that's what that, that's referring to. It's, um, it's a big word to describe kind of a relatively rudimentary um, you know, concept, which is literally injecting superficial veins with a substance that irritates them and makes them go away. All right, thank you. Thanks for explaining that. Um, in any case, do um, spider or varicose veins ever go away on their own or is 
treatment ever, you know, is treatment always necessary? I um, look at treatment for varicose veins as something that should be offered in cases where people have symptoms that are a concern to them and that we can actually link to the varicose veins or offered in situations where, you know, with those more superficial veins, if they're cosmetically bothersome, also offer it as a treatment. Usually once a vein is there, it's there. And it sometimes might look less prominent or more prominent depending on what you're doing. Um, but just because a varicose vein is there does not necessarily mean that it actually needs to be removed or treated or addressed. It's much more so based on whether or not, you know, the patient is having symptoms that are concerned to them. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, now, another question I have um, that I think a lot of people would really want to know is, uh, is treatment for varicose veins uh, covered by insurance? That's a, it's a good question. And uh, it, it makes me glad that um, I am not um, on the business side of medicine because it is, uh, it seems to be an ever-changing landscape in terms of insurance and all the complexities there. But what I can tell you um, with regards to varicose vein treatments and specifically the um, treatments involving the ablations and phlebectomies and things like that, where we are treating some of those larger veins. Um, none of those treatments, uh, we don't pursue or, or just go straight into those treatments without going through what we call an insurance authorization process. And um, every insurance is a little bit different in terms of kind of the um, requirements they have. Um, for coverage of a particular procedure. Um, but that is why we make sure that we have a comprehensive evaluation of the patients. And the vast majority of the time, when people have symptoms related to their varicose veins and have the issues with the valves that I was referring to on the ultrasound, the insurance companies are able to cover that as a medically appropriate procedure. And that's something that we, um, you know, have a whole team of folks who are dedicated to specifically making sure that when a patient gets evaluated and if they're interested in pursuing those treatments that they go through a process with insurance to make sure that coverage is, is available for them. Okay. With sclerotherapy, it's, um, it's a little bit different. Um, with okay. most cosmetic procedures, uh, insurance companies are not, you know, um, uh, able to cover. And so those are, are situations where um, there's fee schedules that are outlined for, for patients who are interested. All right, thank you. Thanks for breaking that, breaking that down for us. Um, at this time, I want to take some uh, time to uh, address some of the questions and comments that we received on social media. So thank you for tuning in and sharing those with us and keep them coming. Um, so a uh, quick uh, shout out to um, to AJ. He, he they, well, they asked, uh, can varicose veins recur after surgery? I think we addressed that a little earlier. So I just wanted to let you know that we, we took care of that. Uh, AJ also has another question um, as well. Uh, can diet affect the development of varicose veins? That's a good question. And, you know, I, I think um, indirectly, I can uh, give you a kind of a link, but um, I don't think we have any direct evidence to say this type of diet can cause development of varicose veins. But um, what happens is our venous system tends to um, be very compliant. And what I mean by that is we tend to retain um, fluid or um, dilate our veins when we have a certain amount of salt in our body. And so sometimes people will notice that if they're eating particularly um, kind of high salt diets that not only do they get tend to swell, but sometimes those veins can become even more prominent. Um, but that's kind of an indirect link. I can't tell you that just, you know, certain types of foods will, will make veins more prominent. Um, 
it's normal for us when, for instance, we work out or we do something where we're kind of um, really hot or we're in hot, humid weather, which is going to be coming up here uh, soon. Mm -hmm. What we notice is you look down at your feet, you even look at your hands and you notice, wow, all my veins are bulging. Why is that? That's because the body's natural way of releasing heat from our core or our center is to actually do something called vasodilation, where all the veins kind of open up in order to release heat. And so it's not uncommon in the summer months that you'll notice some veins becoming a little bit more prominent with the heat. Okay. Thank you for, for that response. And thank you for sharing that question. Um, I believe that's all that we have so far. Um, I have one last question for you, uh, Dr. Jaya Balan. Um, why should a patient see a board certified vascular surgeon to treat uh, varicose veins? Why is that um, important? I think it is very important. And the reason is, is because we as um, a, a group of, of uh, physicians have the knowledge and the expertise specifically to look at a patient's entire circulatory system and know kind of the full breadth of treatment options um, that are available. And whether that's minimally invasive options or surgical options, because we have not only access, but the ability to do all of that, we can really individualize and tailor treatments to the patient um, rather than only being able to offer one technique or another. The other piece of it is um, you know, to make sure that if for some reason people have recurrence or complications or anything related to varicose veins, you're seeing someone who's already capable of managing those things. And so for, for all those reasons, I think having a vascular surgeon involved in the care of your vein health is, is really critical. Well, thank you for, for sharing that, uh, Dr. Jaya Balan. Uh, that wraps up our broadcast. Uh, thank you again uh, for joining us today and tuning in. Thanks to our viewers for uh, tuning in as well and sharing your questions and comments with us. Uh, for more information or to schedule an appointment, uh, please call 410-571-8430. We're also going to share that information for you in the comments below. Uh, thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.